Hebrews 9.27 says that it is appointed for men to die once. We all have an appointment with death. If today was your day, your day to die, and you had a choice, would you choose to ask the Lord to extend your life, or would you choose to enter into eternity with Him? Well, that's the position that we find King Hezekiah on our program of the Sunday Sermon with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, welcoming you to hop aboard the Bible bus for another great adventure in God's Word on Through the Bible. Our message today, titled, When Death Should Not Take a Holiday, takes us to Second Chronicles chapter 32, where we find a good king on his deathbed. So as you grab your copy of God's Word and find your place, Second Chronicles 32, I'll share a couple of letters from our fellow listeners. This first one in Poland. First, we hear from a new brother in Christ. Thank you for your words of love and joy. Each message helps me to get through another day. Today I woke up full of the joy of the Holy Spirit and spent time giving praise and thanks to God. I hadn't thought that my life could be this way, but a lot has changed for the better. Having Jesus in my life is renewing me. My life used to seem so dark, but slowly I am beginning to have some hope. Please pray that God will continue to show me the way. And the next we hear from a prisoner who needs our prayers as well. I have ended up here as a result of many mistakes I made, and now I have to find a new way ahead. I don't care. Life has lost its meaning for me. I have nobody who cares or supports me. I don't know what to do. A fellow prisoner told me to listen to your programs, so I am. I would be very happy if you might pray for me. May God be with you. Perhaps I will find him one day. For the time being, I am very confused and lonely. Well, our World Prayer Team is praying for these listeners and thousands of others as we travel on our knees through Poland and Central European countries this week. And we'd love to have you join us as we ask God to reach His whole world with His whole word. For more information and to sign up, visit us at ttb.org forward slash pray. And let's do that now. Heavenly Father, bless your word as it goes out. May it touch the hearts of all who hear it and bring them a greater understanding of who you are and how much you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. When death should not take a holiday, a secular writer wrote a book or a play, I'm not sure which, bearing the engaging and euphemistic title, Death Takes a Holiday. He imagined a brief period, a day, when death released his grip on the world, when he did not dominate the human sin. It was sweet to make believe that death, that terrible dictator, no longer held dominion. It was wonderful to move into the storybook world of fables and fairy stories where death no longer held sway. But this paper doll world of paper mache, may I say to you, is shattered by the raw reality of this present order of things that exist in the world. You and I cannot escape from the present facts of the obituary notices and the cold statement that there are still cemeteries. And the Word of God says, Man goeth to his long home. It's six feet long, if you please. And again, he says, Then shall the dust Return unto the ground. May I say to you that that's the story today of man. And he can't escape even for one day and let death take a holiday. May I say to you that for the child of God, there is coming a day when death will take a permanent holiday. 
Until that day, the Scripture's true. By man came death. And death prevails today. But there is coming a time when it will not only have a permanent holiday, it'll be retired forever, it'll be banished from the scene and from God's universe. We are told that the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death stalks the earth. Unfettered and unbound, he walks the highways, he rides the freeways, he flies by jet, and he's on duty 24 hours a day. He's on duty 60 minutes in each hour and 60 seconds in each minute. He never misses, never misses a moment as far as this world is concerned. And so for the child of God in the present hour, there is always the possibility of death. And if the Lord does not come, death is inevitable. But there is for the child of God a victory over death. Death has been defeated today, but not destroyed. Death has been swallowed up in victory so that even at the cemetery you can say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The Lord Jesus Christ said to those sorrowing sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He could say yonder to John on the Isle of Patmos, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. I am the one who has the keys of death and of the grave. And for that reason, a child of God is not to fear, though death as a dictator walks the world today. For therefore the believer, the sting of death has been removed. It's just the the very thought that Paul has is the, the same thought that you have in the bee. We're told that the bee can only sting once. After he once stings, he can't anymore. And the Lord Jesus Christ bore that sting on the cross for you and me, the penalty, the awful penalty. And therefore, for the child of God today, death has been robbed of that. It's far better, Paul says, to depart and be with Christ. And he talks about, over in Second Corinthians, he talks about this very matter. Will you notice, he says, We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body. And our translation says, to be present with the Lord. But it actually is the same word used back in verse 6, where he said, at home in the body. And it means to be at home with the Lord. Absent from the body means to be at home with the Lord for the child of God. And when Paul wrote his epitaph, which he did in Second Timothy, he says, For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure has come. And the word for departure is a very interesting word. The Greek word is analysis. We get our word analysis from it. And analysis actually is a technical term, a nautical term. And it has to do with a ship that is tied up in the harbor. And the analysis is when it's untied and put out to sea. Quite interesting that today even among Christian writers, you will find they always speak of death uh, being coming into the harbor. I think only one poet has the true picture. Sunset and evening star and one clear call for me. May there be no morning at the bar when I put out to sea. He caught it. May I say to you, that's what death is for a child of God. Paul says that all that I've been in this life, I've been a ship tied up in the harbor. I've had a thorn in my flesh. I've been limited. I've had this body of humiliation. Now he says, 
I'm ready to put out on the sea of life for the first time. What a picture, if you please. That was his, that was Paul's epitaph. It's a blessing, my beloved, that God did not leave man immortal in sin. God said to him when he sinned in the Garden of Eden, he says, by the sweat of your brow you're going to eat of the ground, and dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. We think that's a curse. I do not know about you, but I would not want to live in Los Angeles forever as I'm living today. Oh, I don't have much to complain about, but would you want to continue to live in Los Angeles throughout eternity just as you're living today? May I say to you, the greatest blessing that God brought was that man in sin could not live forever in sin. Therefore, he made a way out for him, and that way, of course, was death. Now, the scripture contains the record of a man who did not die at his appointed time. And I'm very candid to say this morning he should have, but he didn't. The scripture says, Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die. And in God's appointment book, your date is already written down. May I say to you that this man had his date written down, but actually God changed it. That's one of the most amazing things. And the reason God changed it was because he was such a wonderful man. Outstanding, if you please. This man received a reprieve, a stay of execution. He merely postponed, however, the day of, of his death. He would never removed it. He delayed it, but he never canceled it. He removed it 15 years. He extended his lifespan 15 more years than God intended for him to live. Now, Hezekiah is that king. May I say to you that he's one of the best kings that ever ruled in the southern kingdom of Judah. I wonder if you'd like to hear the estimate that's given of him. Over in 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, in verse 5 it says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Will you listen to this? So that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. There was not a king that could excel this king Hezekiah. And we mentioned last Lord's Day morning, and we have mentioned it in our Thursday Bible study, that there were five great periods of revival. The greatest was led by Hezekiah. He is the outstanding king of all of them. Now, he was contemporary with Isaiah. In fact, he and Isaiah were very good friends. And the story of Hezekiah is recorded three times in the Scripture. That's amazing. Only the Gospels record the life of our Lord four times. He's worth recording four times. But may I say to you, Hezekiah was worth recording three times. You have three records given. Second Kings, Second Chronicles, and the prophecy of Isaiah. In fact, in Isaiah from 36 through 39, you have wedged in a little historical section, and it's all about the reign of Hezekiah. Because Isaiah knew him, Isaiah was close to him, and Isaiah had a great deal to say about him. Now, this man was more like David than any that was in his line. And you get that from Second Chronicles. May I say that Second Chronicles always gives us God's viewpoint, and it's always interesting to get his viewpoint. And he compared, in fact, it was a human standard, but God compared all the kings to David. And you'll find the thing that was said of Hezekiah here in Second Chronicles 29, verse 2, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. That doesn't mean everything David did was right, 
But everything that David did that was right, Hezekiah did the same thing. That makes him, you see, an outstanding king. He led, as we've indicated, in the greatest revival and reformation of all time. Will you listen to this? He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he started right. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. God's house had been closed. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street. And he said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. This man at the very beginning began this movement that led to a great revival. And God noted that. Again, verse 20, Then Hezekiah the king rose early, gathered the rulers of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord. He set them a good example. He himself went to the house of the Lord. And we are told that he offered sacrifices there. He had a zeal for God, and he was a good missionary. Will you notice in chapter 30, it says, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover under the Lord God of Israel. This man was an outstanding man, as you can see. He was a missionary. He invited the tribes that had withdrawn from him. He invited them to come back and to join with him in worshiping the living God. And then he did this, verse 15. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month. And the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their places after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. So that he restored the Passover, that feast which definitely and scripturally speaks of the death of Christ. Listen to Paul. Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. And this man restored that feast that pointed to Christ. And my friend, he knew what he was doing. Don't you forget it. He knew exactly what he was doing when he restored this feast. This is Hezekiah, if you please. Now, not only that, he was a man of prayer. And in the time of grave danger, the, the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh with an army of 100,000 men surrounded Jerusalem. It was at this time that Isaiah was such a blessing to Hezekiah. And we are told in the 32nd chapter, verse 20, And for this cause Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven. And God recorded that. And he not only recorded it, but he also recorded the fact that God heard and answered his prayer. Will you listen? And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor, the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. Most remarkable victory, a miraculous victory God gave because of the prayer of Hezekiah, the king, and Isaiah, the son of Amos. May I say to you, he's a man of prayer and a man who got his prayers answered. Now, he took sick. I say to you that the book of Second Chronicles, in fact, both books of Chronicles, gives you God's viewpoint. And if you want to find out about his sickness, you will have to go to Kings or you have to go to Isaiah. Isaiah gives you a great deal of detail about his sickness and the cure of it. it evidently, God never put too much emphasis on healing. When you have his viewpoint, he only gives one verse. When you have man's viewpoint, well, you have several chapters. Quite interesting, by the way, to get God's viewpoint sometimes of these matters that we consider so important. Now, this is all God says here 
In those days, Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. Now, Hezekiah was sick. Isaiah is the one who gives us the detail. Isaiah tells us that he was sick, and the thing that he had was a boil. The Hebrew word, uh, shekin, could mean it's the botch of, of Egypt. It translated, it's the same word used for the disease that Job had. And may I say to you, I believe today if it was diagnosed, it would be cancer. I think that's what he had, was cancer, and it was incurable. And Isaiah tells us that God sent him to tell King Hezekiah that the time had come for him to die, had cancer. And uh, Hezekiah didn't want to die. And that's very natural. None of us want to. Even when our time comes. Now, I I do not know about you, but uh, I don't want to die. Do you want to die? I don't. And if God has it on his calendar for the next few days, I'll pray just as hard as Hezekiah did that he postpone it. And so when Isaiah came in and said, you set your house in order, the time has come for you to die. And uh, he, turned his, he turned his face to the wall, and that means simply that he's now getting down to business and prayer. And he began to pray to God, and he asked God to extend his life. And he put up quite a plea to the Lord. He, and he had something to base it on, too. He said he, he, he called God's attention to the fact of what he'd done as king, and he had. And then God told him, he sent Isaiah and said, I am going to hear and I'm going to answer your prayer, but not because of you, because of David. And friends, if God ever hears and answers our prayer, it'll be because of Christ, never because of us. Never. He never hears and answers prayer because of who we are or what we do. He only hears and answers prayer because of Christ. If ye shall ask anything in my name, hitherto have ye asked the Father nothing in my name, but he says now you ask in my name. That's the only way God's hearing prayer today. And even in Hezekiah's day, though Hezekiah had been an outstanding king, God says to him, it's not for your sake, it's for David's sake. And it's to remind us that he hears and answers prayer. Now God says, I'll extend your life for 15 years. The miracle is not so much that, because if you read Isaiah, you will find out that Well, it's always quite interesting to read what he has to say. For Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. It's the same thing James said. James says, anoint him with oil and call for the elders to pray for him. Same thing. Uh, What James is saying, the anointing with oil is medicinal. That's not ceremony. He says, call for the doctor and call for the elders to pray also. Don't be foolish either way. I think that today we do not pray enough for sick people. I'm confident we do not. When I could not be here Friday night, and I want to tell you, I went home with fever with the idea I'd be out. And uh, I crawled in bed, and, some, and three people came to me this morning and said, we made specific prayer for you. I believe that God hears and answers prayer today for healing, but not for faith healers, but for healing. And I think we ought to pray more for sick people than we pray today. And when you call the doctor... Call for the elders. We got new elders now, quite a few of them. We give them something to do. That's right. That's what they should be doing is praying for the sick. I say to you that uh, 
That is something that should be done. Now this man was healed, and God gave him 15 more years. And I know somebody's out to stand up and shout, Hallelujah! God heard and answered prayer. It's too bad he did. It's too bad that he did. It's too bad that Hezekiah didn't die when his time came. He should have. Death should not have taken a holiday. You say, why? I want to suggest to you three reasons this morning why death should not have taken a holiday. Now, I turn back to God's account, Second Chronicles, to get his viewpoint of this matter. He, he only gave one verse, and then he makes this rather unusual statement. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Uh, it's interesting. I've always noticed this, that these folk who feel like they have sort of a special wire into God and that they seem to get special answers, I've never found one of them yet that's humble. I wonder why that's true. May I say to you, my beloved, that this man, Hezekiah, was not unlike the rest of the vegetable variety of humanity. He, uh, though he was king, when God extended his life for 15 more years, he was lifted up with pride, and God immediately began to judge the nation, notwithstanding Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. He, uh, he was lifted up with pride. But the minute the judgment came, this man humbled himself, and then God withheld the judgment until later. May I say to you that this sort of thing is apt to minister to pride. We're apt to boast of it. There's a danger in boasting my beloved. Now the second thing is that uh, he did something that actually brought down the house upon his line. He brought the Babylonians uh, to destroy his city. And uh, the thing that he did was a, a very tragic thing. Now if you'll notice that he mentions that in Second Chronicles, but gives us no detail. Will you notice this? How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. Now the thing that happened was that this man Hezekiah, when he got well, the king of Babylon heard about it and was such a remarkable thing that he sent his ambassador and uh, his ambassadors to bring him gifts and to congratulate him that he got well. And what did Hezekiah do? He did a very foolish thing. This is what he did. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he'd heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Hezekiah was glad of them. It just tickled him to death that the king of Babylon would uh, send him a get well card. He just had never expected that to happen at all. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things. The silver and the gold and the spices precious ointment, the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. That was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. He was so elated, so flattered, that he said to these ambassadors, would you like to have the $5 tour? I'll give you the $5 tour of Jerusalem. I'll let you see the treasure." I let you see inside the cave at Fort Knox, and you know all the gold that I've got. And he did that. And these ambassadors saw it all. They made mental note of it. 
And you will find that a little later, a king of Babylon by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, a brilliant general, needed gold. And some of those that were his librarians, they came to him and says, You know, it's written down here that in the days of Baladan, Merodach, the ambassadors were in Jerusalem, and you want to know where the gold market is being cornered? It's in Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar says, That's all I want to know. That's where we're going. And that's where they went. And they besieged the city and took it. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, let's let Isaiah tell us. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They're, they're come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that's in mine house have they seen. There's nothing among my treasures that I've not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the day is come. It's all in thine house. That which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. You made a terrible blunder, Hezekiah. Why didn't you die when your time came? He'd been a great king, a good king. He'd been a wise king. He'd made, oh, decisions, marvelous decisions. But now he plays the fool. Imagine taking these gold-hungry Babylonians in and letting them see the treasures of the world of that day, for that's where they were in Jerusalem. Isaiah said, you've made an awful blunder in doing this. God wants you to know that he'll judge you for this. Interesting. Behold, the days come, all of this shall go. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken, he said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. Believe me, Hezekiah certainly plays the fool here. He says, Well, it, it won't happen in my day, and I'm glad for that. Same sort of a heritage we're passing on to our children today. He says, It won't take place in my day, but the catastrophe will come later. It did come later. Not many years after this, if you please. That's the second reason death should not have taken a holiday. The third reason is this. The worst king that ever ruled was Manasseh. He was worse than any king in the northern kingdom where they were all bad. He was worse than Ahab and Jezebel put together. And when you add them up, You've got something. But this man, Manasseh, stands out on the page of Scripture and is described as the worst king that ever lived. Who was he? Hezekiah was the best king. He had a son, and his son was Manasseh. We are told that Hezekiah died... And Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Will you notice what is said next? Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. God extended his life 15 years. In that 15 years, Manasseh was born. Had he died at the appointed time, Manasseh would never have been born. But he was in that interval. The worst king. In fact, it's my own personal belief that it's during that period the kind of glory of God departed 
and Ichabod was written over that temple and that city. It was during that period that this nation went to the very lowest, and God said after Manasseh, there is no hope for the nation. Even the revival of Josiah merely postponed the evil day. God says in my clock, the time has come. Manasseh has gone the limit. He stepped over the line. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Death should not have taken a holiday. If death had not taken a holiday, this man, Hezekiah, would never be revealed as a man of pride. He never would have played the fool, and he never would have had a son by the name of Manasseh. You know it's not always best for God to answer our prayers the way we pray them. Our Lord says, if you shall ask anything in my name, oh, to have a prayer in his name means to be according to his will. That will bring glory to him. So we pray like that. And then, my beloved, I close. You may delay death. You might be able to postpone it. You will not be able to remove it. Oh, we are living in a day when the life expectancy has been extended. And there are today senior citizens, homes, senior citizens, villages and cities, retirement cities. A friend of mine living in one in Arizona, when I was there the last time speaking, I said, how do you like it? Well, he said, we have everything. They've provided everything. But he says there's one thing that makes this place the most morbid place in the world to live. There is never a day but what the hearse doesn't back up at some home. And you know, one day it'll back up at yours. May I say you can postpone it. You cannot cancel it. If the Lord has, all of us will go through that day, through that door of death. My friend, in view of that fact, what manner of folk should we be today? What is the intelligent way to live today? What is the, the smart thing for a human being to do with that inevitability that's down ahead of him? You can postpone it, never cancel it out. Pointed under man wants to die and after death, the judgment. In the first church that I served when I was ordained in Nashville, Tennessee, there was a very lovely, cultured lady who came alone to the church every Sunday. Her husband was not saved. He was a very prominent man in the city. He owned a large coal company. He was active in politics. In fact, he was one of the group of men in the inner circle that ran the city and the county. My uncle was a, an elected officer in the county and had been for 25 years, and he was very close to this man. This man had diabetes. He was in the hospital. His wife called me, and she said, I want you to come out. And they called me by my first name there, for they knew me very well. I'd been raised there. They said, Vernon, would you come out to the hospital and talk to him? I said, I want you to talk to Fred. He's come and listened to you preach. He thinks you're a nice boy and all that sort of thing. I think he'll listen to you. And I want to say to you, I was frightened because as a boy, I'd, he's a great big fellow. 
not always in his presence, had been frightened. I postponed it as long as I could, and it was one of those miserable, cold winter days. And about 5.30 in the afternoon, I went by the hospital. The minute I walked in the room while his wife was sitting there, she says, Oh, I'm going home. <laughs> and so I sat down, and I began to talk with him. And we talked about everything under the sun, except what I came to talk about. It seemed so difficult to get it on the track. He knew what I was going to say finally, and I knew what I was going to say finally, but we both went down every detour. And then finally I blurted out as a young preacher, I said, Mr. Cassidy, you know you're going to die. When you die, where are you going? And then he began to put up a front. He said, you know, I've been in the coal business, and he says, I've sent a ton of coal here, and I've sent a ton of coal there. In fact, that's the way he controlled that ward out there that uh, my church was in, was sending tons of coal to people. It was a pretty cheap way, in one sense, to control the ward. But he began to blow about it, how charitable he was and all his good works. And I didn't know anything to say except just turn to the third chapter of Romans and say, God says you're a sinner. And I'd keep coming back to it after he'd blow about what he'd done. I'd say, but God says you're a sinner. And he'd say something else and I'd say, God says you're lost. And finally, I just gave up. I decided that I was going to leave, that I had I'd done all I could do. I gave him the gospel, and I was going to leave. And something strange happened. This great big man, lying that dying, he said, uh, Vernon, you're right, I'm an awful sinner. And he accepted Christ as his Savior. The next morning when his wife came in, she called me. And she was weeping. She says, you know, he said he never slept a wink last night. He spent all night confessing his sin. And she said, you know, he had quite a few of them. He died the next afternoon, and I had the privilege at his funeral of saying this man on his deathbed confessed Christ to his Savior. It's a point under man wants to die after death, the judgment. You may postpone it, and it may be a tragic mistake to postpone it, but my beloved, it's inevitable if the Lord tarries. And there is the judgment of great white throne. Unless you trust Christ, who bore the penalty for your sin on the cross. Well, Dr. McGee was certainly clear. We all have an appointment with death at some point. But through the cross, God offers us another option. If you'd like to know more about the eternal life that God offers us through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ, then visit our website at ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There we've placed several resources that you can listen to and read, or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and we'll send you a few in the mail. To share today's message, When Death Should Not Take a Holiday, with a family member or friend, have them listen to ttb.org forward slash Sunday Sermon. Our fascinating study of Second Chronicles continues this week on the daily broadcast of Through the Bible's program, so I hope that you'll hop aboard the Bible bus and you'll join us. To listen online or see if your station carries the daily broadcast, just visit us at ttb.org, or if we can help you find a station in your area, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'm praying that our great God fills you with His grace, mercy, and peace as you walk with Him today. to Him I Sin had left a crimson
We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.